Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Grayville. I am a PhD student here at the University of Arizona. And today I'm going to be talking about the geography and history of Morocco. So I will start the screen share. All right, so, so we're gonna start out the presentation talking a little bit about um, geography. So, one of the most important things about Moroccan geography is one, it's not all the all Sahara Desert, but it's two, the Atlas Mountains that kind of serve as this backbone slash ridge of the country that divides these fertile plains, um, as you can see right about here, if you can see my cursor, from the Sahara Desert. And this has a lot of implications into the history of Morocco as well as its geography. And so currently Rabat is the capital here on the coast, about 60 kilometers um, north of Casablanca. It's about an hour and 15 minutes by train. So just to show you what this looks like on the ground, you have examples of kind of the varied geography and topography of Morocco. So in the upper left-hand corner of the screen share, you can see essentially these very green mountains, and those are the Rift Mountains in the north. And whereas the bottom left, you can see this kind of just grassy plain. So that's where you have the breadbasket of Morocco. And that is between um, essentially Meknes and Fez, so in the center of the country. So of course you have this urban rural contrast, so the upper middle picture is actually um, a scene in La Ville Nouvelle or the new city in Fez. In contrast, you have a more rural area in the High Atlas Mountains in the bottom center that Kind of, if you look at the mountains, almost resemble um, the topography here in Tucson. And then in contrast, you also have the Sahara Desert. Um, this is the oasis town of Marzuga on the top right. And then the bottom right is um, an example of the beachfront in Casablanca. So one of the important things to note about Morocco is they have what are called imperial cities, and there are four of them. So what that means is an imperial city um, either was or is currently the capital of Morocco, um, Rabat being the current capital. So starting with the very first capital, you have Fez, which is located in kind of the central north area of Morocco. And so here are just some images um, so on the top right, you have the entrance gate to the Medina or Old City in Fez. In the center, you have the gates to the Royal Palace, since the King of Morocco has a residency there when he wants to escape the humidity of Rabat. Um, the bottom right-hand picture is a scene from the rooftop, so you can see essentially what the Fez city line is like in the old city. Um, Fez is remarkable because it has an intact medieval city. And so a lot of people have studied the architecture of Fez to look at medieval Islamic architecture, particularly how um, buildings were built facing this central courtyard. Because one, that shields um, you from view from the street, but two, also allows air circulation, which is particularly useful for Fez because it can get well over 100 degrees during the summer. And then on the left-hand side, you have essentially the entrance to a madrasa or school in modern Fez. And this was built by the Miranid dynasty. Um, and there is actually a twin of this particular madrasa in Meknes which we'll get to in a little bit. So then there is Marrakesh, which is the southernmost imperial city. And it was the base of operations for various Moroccan dynasties, such as the Almoravids, Almohads, and the Sadians later on. 
Um, one of the notable landmarks in Fez is the Kutubia Mosque, which you can see its minaret in on the left-hand side. And as I mentioned earlier about the inward-facing architecture, you have this example on the upper right of what a Riyadh looks like. So a Riyadh is a traditional style house in Morocco. Uh, the name Riyadh actually refers to garden because usually there are trees and sometimes fountains in the center of this. But this is an example of how everything faces a courtyard. And then in the bottom, you have the souk or market in Fez. This is just one example. This is a covered section. So moving on to the city I mentioned earlier in terms of having the twin um, madrasa or school, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner. Now, Meknes essentially is an imperial city because of one man in particular, Mule Ismail bin Sharif, and he was a member of the Alawit dynasty, the current um, dynasty that the king of Morocco today is descended from, where he moved the capital to Meknes during his lifetime. And the bottom right-hand corner is an example of the horse stables that he had built, which then brings us to Rabat. So Rabat is the capital of Morocco, and it is where the parliament is, as well as where the king's usual residence is. So in the upper picture, you have a good picture of what the kasba, or essentially the main fortified part of Rabat looks like overlooking the river. Now this picture is taken across the um, river from the city of Saleh, which is just to the north, which today Saleh was this very famous or infamous pirate capital, but today is essentially um, a larger kind of city that's connected to the greater Rabat Saleh area. And a lot of people who work in Rabat actually live and commute from Saleh. Speaking of commuting, one of the nicer things about Rabat is its public transit system. Besides taxis being very affordable, um, you have a tram that runs through a good portion of the city, as pictured there. So, and then in terms of its history, though, because Rabat was essentially built up by the Almoravids as a launching point for their invasion of what would become Spain, you have the Hassan Tower, which was never fully completed, but it was initially intended as being part of the largest mosque in the world. And the minaret, or at least the partially completed minaret you can see in the left-hand corner, um, is only about halfway finished. It was supposed to be twice the height it was, but it was abandoned after the death of the Sultan and further damaged by an earthquake. So it remains this historical site. So having covered briefly some of the geography, which we'll get back to other notable places at the end, we'll move on to history portion. So prehistoric and ancient Morocco. So humans have inhabited Morocco for many millennia. Um, recently, by recently, I mean within the last five years, an archeological find actually found a fossil or human skeleton that dates back to about 300,000 years. So putting some of the earliest humans actually in North Africa. Fast forward essentially to the ancient world, you have these various Amazir or are also known as Berber communities living in North Africa. Um, so here is a uh, map I was able to find in the public domain that shows essentially the Carthaginian era, but you have these independent kingdoms, so it's labeled on the map as Mauritania, which of course gives rise to the name Moors, which is sometimes applied to North Africa and its inhabitants. But eventually, Rome wins the Punic Wars and takes over large swaths of North Africa. Um, and the northern part of what would become Morocco. 
So one of the best examples of Rome in North Africa are actually the ruins at Volubilis, or known by the locals as Walili. And these are pictures I took back in 2013 when I first visited Morocco. So in the upper left-hand corner, you still have archways as well as a massive kind of almost triumphal arch in the bottom left-hand corner that are still standing after over 2,000 years. One of the cool things about this site is that you can also see these, um, if you look at the mural or kind of frescoed floor in the bottom right-hand corner, that is open air. Uh, there is a rope blocking it off so you can't stand on it, fortunately, but you can go up to and see these, um, these impressive examples of Roman art in person. And the reason why I show you pictures of Volubilis is because it is one of the strategic places near modern day Fez that is capitalized on by one of the first, what we could call Moroccan dynasties. But before we get to that, and talking briefly about the Islamic conquest of Morocco, followed by what is known as the Kharajite or Berber rebellion. So after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, the Islamic community um, names a caliph Abu Bakr, and they continue, and they, it was called the Rashidun Caliphate. However, this caliphate after Ali is taken over by Muawiyah, and they become known as the Umayyads. And they're the ones who complete the conquest of North Africa essentially going all the way to what would become modern Tangier and the Atlantic coast. Now, notably, this, these efforts weren't just by um, Muslim Arabs, but you also have local Amazir Berber uh, soldiers who were recruited into the Muslim army and, of course, convert. Uh, one example of those um, soldiers is Tariq bin Ziyad. So there's the image on the left-hand side shows you what Tariq was imagined to look like later on by 19th century Europeans. And he is responsible for leading then the Umayyad invasion of the Iberian Peninsula, creating what would eventually become Al-Andalus. Additionally, so even though the, some Berbers and Amazir were able to gain positions of high rank, there were issues surrounding the treatments of Amazir members. Um, part of that stemmed from the declaration by some Muslims of the Amazir as being Magi, or essentially pagans, and therefore not subject to the protections that the people of the book, Christians and Jews, enjoyed, even though there were significant Jewish and Christian Amazir populations before this. So this results in a growing discontent. While this is going on, there are essentially splinter groups um, two of which become the Shiites and the Kharajites or Khwarij, um, those who go out. So uh, early Islam essentially ends up splitting into these three different factions or parts that eventually more solidly cement themselves over um, the centuries. Most people are familiar with the Sunnis and Shiites, but fewer people are familiar with the Kharijites, who are actually the first to leave the main fold of the Muslim community. So a lot of these Kharijite preachers found essentially refuge in North Africa and encouraged the local Amazir population to rebel because their argument was that as Muslims, they should be treated on equal plane, on an equal level to the Arab Muslims who tried to cement their power. So the result of this is essentially the western part of the Maghreb, what would become part of Algeria and modern-day Morocco, successfully rebel. And that permanently cuts off um, control by 
these Arab Muslim dynasties. That being said, some of the Shia community are able to capitalize on this. So you have Moulay Idris, who founds what is known as the first Moroccan dynasty. So the Idrisids essentially reign from 788 to 974 CE. And so Moulay Idris is actually a Shia, and he himself was a descendant of the Prophet's family and had been forced into North Africa to try to escape persecution by the Umayyads. And so in the bottom left-hand corner is the city of Moulay Idris, which is near modern-day Fez. And that is where his tomb is, and it's considered a sacred site by Moroccans. What Idris I does is he cements his power base near Volubilis and founds what would become the city of Fez. And he's able to cement his power by allying himself with a local prominent Berber tribe. Um, so he passes away, but his son is born very shortly after because his mother was pregnant with him when Idris I died. So Idris II continues cementing his power base and adding to um, the city of Fez. And what he does is essentially try to Islamize and Arabize the local population and is partially successful. It's the beginning of what, this long period of linguistic Arabization, um, particularly it takes hold in urban centers. Fez is also notable, not only for being the first sort of capital of historical Morocco, but also being the site of one of the oldest um, universities in the world. So the University of Karawain, named for the city of Karawain in Tunisia, was founded by a woman named Fatima who left an endowment to fund a school and it became the site of Islamic learning and notables such as Ibn Khaldun even studied there. Now, during the Idrisid reign, they didn't have complete control over what would become modern Morocco. Uh, there was what was called the Barwata Confederacy, which was the local Amazir Confederacy that um, practiced their own syncretic form of Islam and they're accused of committing heresy for essentially having what is called a Berber Quran or this holy book written in a language other than Arabic. However, this Idrisid, going back to it, this Idrisid Shiite dynasty is eventually replaced by the Almoravids, which get their name from the Arabic al murabitun meaning the ones of the fortified place of the Rabat. They emerge out of the Sahara, and the version of Islam that they practice is the Sunni Maliki Islam, and they want to supplant this kind of early Shiism in Morocco. And they're able to do that quite successfully. So the map here actually shows two successive Amazir dynasties, with the Almoravids being the first. And you can see the dotted line outlining roughly the area that they controlled. So they emerge out of the Sahara and establish Marrakesh as their power base. The kind of cementing Marrakesh as the second imperial city. Interestingly enough, the Umayyad Caliphate in Islamic Spain, or Al-Andalus, is struggling at this time. And they ask, essentially, their Muslim ruler of the Almoravids for assistance. And this result, um, and this is during the reign of probably the most famous Almoravid ruler, whose name is Yusuf bin Tashfin. Yusuf bin Tashfin is an interesting figure who has been maligned by some historians who accuse him of not actually speaking Arabic. Um, some documentation suggests that he actually always had a translator on hand because he himself was a native Berber speaker. But regardless of that, Yusuf bin Tashfin prepares for this conquest by 
going to what would become Rabat and pulling his army together before invading and subjugating um, southern parts of Spain and taking away power from the Muslim rulers who had already established themselves there. So while they're pushing for this shift to Sunni Malikism, Maliki being a sub-branch of Sunnism, there's also other challenges to their rule. And a notable challenge is a man named Ibn Tumart, who himself was a preacher. And he claimed that the Almoravids were actually, essentially that they had been corrupted by the riches and the splendor of the Muslim cities in the Iberian Peninsula, and that they needed a return to this you know, strict, almost Puritan-like interpretation of Islam, which is where the Almohads get their name. So Almohad is the English pronunciation of a Spanish term, but its original term is al muwahidun which means essentially muwahidun is like, are the people who believe in one God, Wahid being one in Arabic. And so there were these strict um, Unitarians of a sort, emphasizing the oneness of God. And so they oust the Almoravids from power and establish their own dynasty, which then gains control of parts of modern day Algeria and Tunisia, as well as maintaining a hold in southern Spain. However, they're not able to hold on to power forever and they're eventually replaced by a subsequent dynasty. In terms of how people analyze this, it's interesting because Ibn Khaldun, who is a famous sociologist and historian um, from the later medieval era, who studied in uh, Fez at one point, comes up with this theory of this cycle of dynastic cycle, claiming that about four generations is enough for a dynasty to rise and fall. His logic is that these early, like the originators or creators of the dynasty come from the outskirts or the edges of society, usually being semi-nomadic or nomadic and conquer these civilized urban peoples. The second generation maintains a connection to the first and has grown up with exposure to that. By the third generation, there's only a slight tangible connection and that ruling class has adopted to this urban life that it supposedly corrupts them and weakens them. The fourth generation then is the generation that has no connection to the first and second and is in turn then easily displaced by someone else from the margins. So there are counterexamples to this, but this is an interesting way of looking at North African history, particularly Moroccan history, as you see dynasty coming to replacing dynasty after so many generations. So the Marinids are another Almazir dynasty, however, this time coming from a different group. Rather than speaking Tashilhit, they speak what is called Zanata, which is the most similar to Rifian Berber, which is still spoken today in northern Morocco. So the Marinids move the capital back to Fez. And it's during the Marinid dynasty that you have essentially the beginning of the end of the Reconquista. So in the Iberian Peninsula, the Spanish are working on, Spanish and Portuguese are working on taking back or trying to take back the Iberian Peninsula from these Muslim rulers. However, before the end of the conquest, the Watasids, which were a cadet branch of the Marinids, um, end up capitalizing on a rebellion and seizing power. It's during their rule that in 1492, the Iberian Peninsula, the Recon 
Kista is finished, and you have this expulsion of Muslims and Jews from the Iberian Peninsula. And so a lot of the Jewish Iberians end up migrating to Fez. And that adds to Jewish population. A lot of people unfamiliar with Moroccan history don't realize that there has always been this um, Jewish segment of the population that contributed to Moroccan history. And at its height, uh, the population numbered anywhere between 250,000 to 300,000 members. Uh, there are still Jewish populations today in Morocco, primarily in Casablanca and Rabat. But during the Watasid era, there was a significant number living in Fez. And so there's this Jewish quarter still today called the Milha in Fez. And it's right next to the imperial palace, kind of signifying the sultan's protection of this community. It was also in this era that you had essentially the patronage and establishment of these schools with the madrasas that I talked about in Fez and Meknes being built during this time. However, as Moroccan history sort of repeats itself, you have another group that comes from essentially the Sahara and displaces the Watasids. So you have the Saadians. And the Saadians are the first Arab dynasty since the Idrisids to take power in what would become Morocco. So on the left is actually a picture of the Saadian tombs in Marrakesh. Um, so this is where most of the members of the dynasty were buried. So the Saadians essentially move their power base to Marrakesh. Now, it's during this time that you also have some conflicts with the Portuguese and Spanish. Notably, you have the Battle of the Three Kings that occurs in northern Morocco. And what happens then is one of the newly crowned sultans goes to battle. And the Portuguese king, Sebastian I, is actually killed in this battle. And he didn't have any heirs, so it starts the succession crisis back in Portugal, which ends up resulting that Spain capitalizes on this to reform to form the Iberian Union, which lasts a total of 60 years. But the reason I mention this is because Portuguese and Spanish intervention and attempted invasions of Morocco will continue on. A lot of people don't realize this, but in Portugal, I mean, in, um, in Morocco, there are various cities that were under the control of the Portuguese, El Jadida, Agadir, being some of them, as well as the city of Ceuta, which today is a Spanish enclave. So the Sadians maintain their hold for a while. However, there's this group in the city of Sijumasa, which you can see on the map here, that will eventually displace them. Now, the Aluit dynasty that replaces them won't be able to quite regain all the territory that the Sadians controlled because the Sadians actually fought against the Songhe Empire and using imported guns from the Portuguese are actually able to seize the city of Timbuktu in modern day Mali. Um, this kind of cements part of what was the Trans Saharan trade, which things like salt and gold traversed the Sahara and were very important in terms of like gaining uh, monetary wealth. So the Alawite dynasty emerging from Sijan Masa and displacing the Sadians is the current dynasty um, in Morocco today. Now, it's at this point that it's essentially the Sultanate of Morocco. One of the notable things about the Alawite dynasty, besides that they are the current dynasty and 
have outlasted all the previous dynasties is that they have the distinction of Morocco being the first country to recognize the United States because of an Alawite Sultan. So a lot of Moroccans like to talk to Americans about this as like talking about how Morocco and the US have always been friends. So essentially, shortly after the Declaration of Independence, um, the Moroccan Sultan is looking for these allies and trade partners to kind of combat growing European influence in North Africa. And so what he does is he issues the statement saying that the ships from these countries or the ships flying these flags are allowed safe harbor in Morocco. And one of those was the United States of America. Now this was quite literally a few months before the French recognized the United States. So Morocco has the distinction of being the first country to recognize the United States. Um, in return, the U.S. establishes this friendship treaty with Morocco, and it's later on renewed, and it is the longest standing friendship treaty the U.S. has with any country. Now, the Alawite dynasty, one of their major um, pushes later on, particularly in the 1800s, is to try to combat this growing influence of the Europeans, because in 1830, France invades neighboring Algeria. So some of these reforms are essentially book printing in Fez, um, teacher training, as well as trying to modernize the Moroccan military, because Morocco has this military past and they were the only North African country not to be controlled by the Ottoman Empire. That being said, you have what sparks is the Tetuan War between Spain and Morocco. And it's a very short war, but the result is Morocco agrees to pay reparations as a result of this. And However, the reparations are so great that they can't really afford to pay them. So the British actually offered to loan the Moroccan government money to do so. And at the time, it was a sum of uh, 500,000 pounds. So in order to pay off this debt, Morocco agrees to allow um, customs officials and tariff officers to tax Moroccan goods. This, of course, creates some resentment in the population. So these European powers are then disputing who's going to have influence in Morocco. Because France is trying to increase their influence because one of their fears is that the Moroccan Sultan will support essentially this Algerian resistance to their reign. That being said, the German Kaiser also wants to avoid France gaining influence. So the Kaiser actually goes to Tangier and to advocate for the sovereignty of the Sultan. And this, you know, international squabbling happens in what's known as the first Moroccan crisis. As part of it, France essentially agrees with Germany that they will cede various parts of control in what would be Cameroon today in exchange for allowing them to have influence in Morocco. Additionally, the French are kind of working with the Spanish to divide up the area because prior to this, Spain had invaded what would become Western Sahara. So, the first Moroccan crisis is followed a few years later in 1911 by the second Moroccan crisis. So there is this popular uprising against the Sultan. So the French on the pretext of supporting the Sultan ends up essentially moving military forces 
around in Morocco to crush this rebellion. And then you have the Treaty of Fez that is signed, which makes Morocco a protectorate. It's a similar model to the protectorate status of neighboring Tunisia. Neighboring meaning in North Africa, because Algeria at that point was considered French by the French. So you have essentially these two different cases of colonization in the Maghreb by the French. You have the colonization direct rule in Algeria, and then you have the protectorates established in Tunisia and Morocco. Now, this protectorate lasts from 1912 to 1956. So as part of this protectorate, you have the establishment of Spanish Morocco, which is in the north. But because of the Kaiser's earlier advocacy, Tangier stays this international zone. And this is where Tangier's reputation as like this kind of place for international espionage emerges. So the French gain control over what would become most of modern day Morocco, which is why French is kind of like the unofficial uh, additional language of Morocco, because according to the constitution today, only Tamazir to Berber and Arabic are the two languages. What France does is move the capital with the begrudging consent of the Sultan from Fez to Rabat, which is still the present day capital. So one of the things that the French and Spanish do or try to set up these schools. So in Spanish Morocco, they set up these schools to teach Spanish along with Arabic, whereas in the rest of Morocco under French control, they set up these French schools and then they have the Sultan issue what is known as the Berber Dhaher, or a royal decree, Berber royal decree, which states that the Amazir Berber population is now going to follow customary law rather than Islamic law. And this creates a fervor and resistance to the French rule. There are as a result, the French spend a while trying to pacify certain regions of Morocco, one being the High Atlas Mountains, which it takes them until 1922 to fully pacify. Meanwhile, in the north of Morocco, you have this group, you have Abdel Krim, who establishes, who rebels against the Spanish and establishes what is known as the Rif Republic, which you can see on this map here from the time. So it says like, you know, map of military operations. And so this border that you can see that I'm moving the cursor on is essentially the Rif Republic at its greatest extent. Now this rebellion was nearly successful and this Rift Republic lasted a few years. What's controversial about it is Abdel Krem, who was initially essentially viewed as this nationalist, then also declares that he wants to separate it from even the Sultanate of Morocco. Now this rebellion was on the verge of success before the French actually intervene and fight alongside the Spanish against these Rifian or Berber troops and they quashed the rebellion. But that's just one example of resistance to colonial rule. So you have the emergence in 1937 of the Istiqlal party. Um, Istiqlal meaning independence. And they advocate for Moroccan independence. So while this is going on, World War II breaks out. And so in planning essentially the war, Roosevelt goes to Morocco and meets with the other allied um, leaders to determine part of the plan for the rest of the war. And so during this time, he meets with the Sultan Mohammed V. And uh, allegedly during the meeting, um, 
Roosevelt gives his support, says like to Muhammad V, that he'll support Moroccan independence. Now, the French are growing concerned because of this growing national support surrounding um, Muhammad V and decide to exile him and replace him by uh, his uncle. Now this exile lasts about a little over two years and at this point there is other skirmishes and attacks against French police officers and the military and so the French decide that the situation of Morocco is no longer tenable so they bring back uh, Mohammed V from exile in Madagascar. So he comes back in 1955 and then declares that Morocco will be independent and is granted, and Morocco is granted independence by the French. So shortly after independence, um, Sultan Mohammed V becomes the first king of Morocco. And so there have been three kings of Morocco currently. And they're all, um, two of which are former kings now buried in the Alouette Mausoleum in Rabat. And so here's a picture of Muhammad V on the cover of Time magazine. So upon Muhammad V's death in 1961, King Hassan II comes to power. And so his reign is contrasted by two parts. The first is the consideration of what they call the years of lead, les années de plomb, where he brutally suppresses uh, revolts in the Rift Mountains in northern Morocco and jails dissidents. However, towards the second half of his reign, he adopts this more reformist, loosening attitude, this kind of what some historians like uh, Susan Gilson Miller describe as the velvet glove approach. One of the two notable things that happened during his reign is that the first Moroccan constitution is established and the Istiqlal party, which had been in opposition, also is voted out of power. Um, the Istiqlal party having had essentially their leader, Alal Al-Fazi, becoming the second prime minister. And one of the Istiqlal's party's earliest um, objectives was actually to try to reclaim what they called Greater Morocco, which included the Western Sahara, Mauritania, and a portion of what is now Western Algeria. So, once um, Hassan II is able to outmaneuver and kind of subdue the Istiqlal party, he drops um, the pretense of trying to have this expanded Morocco. However, that doesn't eliminate his claims for the Western Sahara, or as a lot of Moroccans refer to it, the Moroccan Sahara. So in 1975, you have what is called the Green March, where Hassan II leads these peaceful protests where they march across the border into what is what is um, Spanish-controlled Western Sahara. And so the Spanish government backs down and cedes control to Morocco and Mauritania, with eventually Mauritania withdrawing and Morocco taking over the remaining part of the Sahara, Western Sahara. Now, there are resistance movements to this, and in this kind of brief overview, I won't go into it too much, but you have then the Polisario Front that is funded by Algeria, partially, or at least given support nominally by Algeria. So, one of the notable things at the end of his reign is Hassan II's decides that they're going to allow more recognition of this Amazir Berber heritage because starting in the 70s, there was this growing Amazir cultural movement to reclaim Amazir culture and support use of Amazir languages. However, he dies before implementing any of these reforms. So 
Upon his death, you have the ascendancy of Muhammad VI, who is the current king of Morocco. And one of the earliest things he does is institute a Zahir, uh, a royal decree, creating the Royal Institute for Amazir Culture Studies, um, determined to kind of standardize um, Tamazir or Berber as well as do more linguistic research on that. So fast forward to 2011, you have the Arab Spring protests happening all over the country. And what Muhammad VI decides to do is he goes out and gives a speech saying that they will have a new constitution which gives more power to the parliaments, as well as that they will recognize Berber as an official language. And so you have the creation of this text, which I have right here. Um, so essentially the Moroccan constitution now states that, so Arabic is the official language of the state. The state works for the protection and development of the language and promotion of its use. Likewise, Tamazirt constitutes an official language of the state, being a common asset for all Moroccans. And so with some of these reforms, as well as parliamentary reforms, meaning that the king still appoints the prime minister, but he has to do so from the ruling party or ruling coalition. Um, Morocco is able to stave off a lot of the unrest that happens in other Arabic countries, leading to the rise of the term, of the, term the Moroccan exception. So now that I've covered a kind of brief overview of history, sorry for all the info, it's hard to condense. Um, that much history into one place. I'm going to return to uh, talking about a little bit about geography and notable places. So the first is I had mentioned briefly when I talked about Port the Portuguese involvement in Morocco is the city of Agadir. It is notable besides becoming a sort of beach resort that's popular with Europeans as being one of the urban centers with a lot of Tamazir or Berber speakers, um, the variety spoken there being Tashilhit and um, University of Zubair, which is located in Agadir, actually has one of the uh, first Amazir language programs and departments looking at um, studying the language. And so above the marina, you can see into the hillside these um, signs. And the sign, and so that sign is essentially the motto of Morocco. So it says, Allah al Watan al Malik. So, God, country, or homeland, and king. So then you have the city of Warzazat, um, Warzazat being the Arabic pronunciation. And so, what Warzazat is become famous for, besides having some incredible kasbas um, in the surrounding valley, is essentially being the film studio of Morocco. So a lot of films that you see in the West that take place in like Egypt, for instance, are actually filmed in Morocco. And so, as you can see with the film studio, um, with the pharaohs displayed there, so notable films like The Gladiator or The Mummy have all been filmed in Morocco. Then you have the oasis town of Merzouga that I mentioned earlier was showing different parts of geography. Um, so what's remarkable about Merzouga is actually the sand dunes. And so there's a local tourist industry built off of um, taking tourists out into the dunes and camping overnight so they can experience the Sahara. Then you have the High Atlas Mountains. And so this is pictures I took at the town of Amzrai and Zawiyat and Hansen, um, which is one of the places that actually the French struggled to control, partially because of its remoteness, but also because of its alliance with 
powerful nomadic tribes that fought against the French military. That being said, today, you know, visitors are welcome. Um, they finished um, the road. They paved the road leading to Amzrai back in 2012. So it's now considerably easier to get to. Then you have the coastal city of Esfera, uh, north of Agadir. And so besides being a Portuguese, former Portuguese controlled city, and you can see some evidence from the architecture at the port there, is most famous for Jimi Hendrix visiting there. And there's a lot of cafes and things with Jimi Hendrix themes as a result. Further up the coast, you have essentially the city of El Jidida. And so you have examples of Portuguese architecture there with the Portuguese cistern on the left. Um, and you can see in the bottom right-hand corner some of the Medina or old city walls. Now, El Jidida is notable for its beaches. So a lot of Moroccans actually go there to go to the beach. Then you have Shafshawan, which is located in the Rif in northern Morocco. And so it's a very beautiful city. It's known for its blue um, paint, essentially the blue kind of theme it has for all its buildings throughout. Um, so the view on the upper left-hand side is actually a view from just outside of the city looking in um, from where they call the Spanish mosque because the Spanish had built a mosque there out away from the city. And this is a place that um, a lot of my Moroccan friends like to visit. Um, and now it's starting to grow a tourist industry. Now, jumping further north, you have the city of Tangier. Um, besides being part of the international zone, one of the notable things about Tangier is it has the oldest U.S. diplomatic property in the world. So the American legation, which you can see the crest for in the upper right-hand corner. And the bottom right-hand corner shows more of the legation. So this was essentially the first U.S. embassy in Morocco. So with that, I... Wish you all safe travels, and I hope you found this presentation informative. If you want more information, because I can't cover everything in such a brief time, I highly recommend A History of Modern Morocco by Susan Gilson Miller. So thank you all, and safe travels.